This lesson is an introduction into hair evidence and how it's used in forensic science. So imagine you're at the scene of a murder. The victim's body is the only discoverable evidence. You don't find any other objects or hints of what may have occurred. But you do find some unique hairs on the victim's clothing. Are these the hairs of the murderer? The suspect themselves? Maybe an animal? Did the victim have a pet? Or is it the hair of an irrelevant individual, such as a family member or a friend, someone not associated with the murder at all? We need to understand how can hair such as these be used to solve cases. So what is hair? Hair is a protein filament that grows exclusively on mammals. Mammals such as monkeys, pugs, and humans. Because mammals frequently lose hair, about 100 a day on average, they are very commonly left at crime scenes. Forensic investigators need to be able to identify hairs, compare it between individuals, and analyze it in order to understand what about the historical events that occurred the hair could tell us. So what is its function? Some animals, like this rat you can see at the top, have hair, whereas others, like the sphinx rat below, don't. What's the whole point of having it? Well, hair helps regulate body temperature. Cold hair will stand up to trap in pockets of air to keep you warm, and when it's hot, hair will actually lay flat to help your body expel more body heat than it normally does. Hair also provides protection. It blocks from UV radiation. Those of you that are lucky enough to have hair on the top, that prevents you from getting sunburned on your scalp. But those that are hair challenged like myself, the UV radiation is no longer being blocked and things like sunburns become more frequent. It also, prevents block, it also blocks entry into areas that we don't want particles to go into. That's why you have eyebrows and eyelashes to keep things from falling into your eyes. And it's also a way of sensing the world. Animals, mammals like yourself, are able to feel when their hair comes in contact with another object, giving them another way to detect their environment. So what causes hair's unique structure? Why is hair so distinct from other tissues like skin? Well, hair is made of a protein called keratin. Proteins are made up of amino acids. You can see an amino acid here. It has an amine group, a carboxyl, and an R group underneath its central carbon. Amino acids can bond together to form long chains that we call polypeptides. And these long chains can be folded and bonded together again to form long, strong fibers in a secondary structure. This is what gives the keratin in hair its sturdiness. And you can see the keratin protein here. It is spiraled and helixed up to make it extra sturdy. This gives hair its unique character, and this is why keratin is often used as a product in hair treatments. What causes hair's color? There's a tremendous diversity of color in hair. Well, the color of hair is determined by a pigment called melanin. Pigments are molecules that are able to absorb or reflect different colors of light. Here's how that works. Let's say you're looking at a leaf that, and you see it as being green. Well, your eyes can only detect light. What's happening is white light in the environment is hitting the leaf, but only the green frequency is hitting your eye, causing you to experience green. All of the colors that are absorbed by the light, the yellows, the orange, the blues that you don't see, are being absorbed, meaning the light energy is converted to a different form inside of the leaf. But the green light is reflected. It changes directions and bounces off of the leaf towards your eye, and that's why you see it as being green. Hair has a huge variety of colors because there are different melanin pigments, different kinds of pigment and different amounts of them. And that variation is what causes some colors to be absorbed and others to be reflected. So where is hair? Well, hair is an outgrowth from skin. And skin is made up of a variety of animal cells that are arranged in layers. A reminder about animal cells. Animal cells are cells that have a nucleus, this giant container that protects the DNA and they have membrane-bound organelles, little tiny organs like the mitochondria, chloroplasts, and the endoplasmic reticulum that maintain the functions of the cell. The most common skin cells that we want to be concerned with, the first and foremost popular skin cell is keratinocytes. Keratinocytes are cells that are filled with the protein keratin. In fact, they're filled with so much keratin that the majority of them are dead. Another kind of cell we want to think about are melanocytes. Melanocytes are cells that produce melanin, the pigment that not only gives hair color, but also gives skin its color. The more melanin you have, the darker your skin tones. And we can see this 
quite explicitly with skin disorders such as vitiligo, like the hands you can see below. With individuals with vitiligo, there are portions of their skin where the melanocytes are dead or no longer work, causing blotches with no pigment. And then there are adipose or fat cells. These are big yellow cells that provide insulation. Skin itself has three layers. The outermost layer is called the epidermis, and we find this on the top. The epidermis is made up mostly of keratinocytes, and most of them are dead and filled with keratin. To understand how keratinocytes work, the living keratinocytes, the ones that are dividing, are at the lowest layer of the epidermis. As they divide, they push up older cells. And as they move further and further up to the surface, they produce more and more keratin. And they end up producing so much keratin that you can see these blank looking cells at the top. The keratin has pushed out all of the organelles and you're left with a dead cell that's just a packet of protective keratin. And that outer layer of dead skin is what you're constantly shedding all the time and forms dust around your home. Below the epidermis is the dermis. This is the middle layer of the skin. The dermis is where you find glands, like sweat glands and oil glands, the base of hair, muscles, nerves, and blood vessels. This is where the melanocytes will be located, the ones that are producing the pigment color of your skin. That's why you still have your skin color, even if you scrape off the first couple of layers. And below the dermis is the subcutaneous layer. This bottom layer is made up of adipose or fatty tissue and is providing insulation and something for the dermal and epidermal layers to attach to. Let's look at the hair specifically. Hair has two primary parts. The first part, the part we know that's protruding out of your body, is the hair shaft. This is a fiber that extends outside of the skin. For forensic purposes, it's important to know that the hair shaft contains no DNA. There's no DNA analysis we can do with it, but it does have a lot of keratin protein. At the base of the hair is a follicle. A follicle is a club-shaped structure that is located in the skin. It's in the dermis. This contains DNA and has blood vessels. Should you find a hair that still has the follicle intact at a crime scene, this is perfect for extracting DNA and running an analysis to try to match the hair to an individual. Looking into the hair shaft, the hair shaft has three unique parts that are important to understand when identifying and comparing hairs. The outermost layer is what we refer to as being the cuticle. It's a transparent outer layer that's actually made up of overlapping scales. And how those scales overlap can vary. You can see a healthy cuticle, they're laying very flat and they're flush, but sometimes they can be raised or you can have damaged layers. Since these can be used to determine the age and health of a hair, it's very helpful in trying to identify who the hair it belonged to. Below the cuticle is the cortex, and this is the inner portion of the hair shaft. It contains melanin granules that cause hair's color. This is where you will find the unique variation and texture and color that people have with their hair. In the middle of the cortex is the medulla, and this is a tube that will run through the length of the hair shaft. The medulla is very unique to individuals. Some people have a long hollow tube, others have broken tubes in unique patterns, and some have no medulla at all. So let's think of the history of the use of hair in forensic science. One of the earliest cases that were solved using a hair was in 1847 with a murder of a Dutch S. In 1883, we had the first mention of hair in a forensic science textbook where it became common practice for investigators to consider hair in their investigations. In 1910, Barthazard and Lampert publish a work using microscope analysis. Using powerful microscopes and new tools, forensic scientists were able to find unique patterns not visible to the eye that can be discernible in matching and comparing hairs. Then in 1934, we have the use of a comparison microscope. A comparison microscope lets you view two objects under the microscope at the same time side by side. Should you find two hairs and want to connect them to see if they're the same hair as far as if they're from the same person, they could be from different people, the comparison microscope is a great tool for quickly being able to identify if there's a match or no match. So let's look at how hair is used in forensic science today. Microscopy is the most common method for analyzing a hair. Using a microscope, we can view and compare cuticles, cortex, and medulla between a variety of different hairs that might be found at a crime scene. 
A light microscope could be used. This will let you view hairs from 10 to 400 times what your naked eye can see, 10x to 400x, and it operates by using light and multiple lenses. Here's an example of the kind of fidelity you can get with a light microscope. Comparison microscopes also have become common practice. This will let you view two hairs side by side to quickly identify any matches or differences. And then there are electron microscopes, microscopes that blast the hair with electrons, providing views up to 50,000 times what's capable with the naked eye. And you can get really fine grain details like in the photo below. Now, there are also chemical tests we can do with hair. Using gas chromatography, we can break down the hair into molecules and analyze what's in it. Your hair represents you and your environment. If you've ingested toxins or drugs or been around toxins and drugs, even how your nutrition has been the last couple of weeks up to a month, that is all contained in your hair. Using gas chromatography, we can break down and see what's present to conclusively determine if you have any toxins present and what your nutritional health is. We can also use isotope analysis. In our environment, we are constantly surrounded by unique isotopes with the oxygen we breathe and the water we consume. And it turns out those isotopes are unique to your geographic region. By determining what isotopes are present in your hair, we could track that to a geography where those isotopes are occurring. And we can do a DNA test if the follicle is there. We can run a biological DNA match to conclusively demonstrate where the hair came from. We can also compare and identify hairs between individuals. Just like fingerprints are unique, so too are cuticles. Cuticles can vary dramatically in their scale patterns, strengths, and locations. Sometimes they're smooth, sometimes they're rough, sometimes they're distant, sometimes they're irregular. By analyzing the cuticles of different hairs, we can figure out whose cuticle belongs to who. The environment can also damage and change cuticles, common hair treatments, Things like being exposed to UV radiation in the sun, those can be determined by looking at the cuticle to understand what environments a suspect may have been in recently. We can also look at the cortex. The cortex varies dramatically in color, texture, and thickness between individuals. This is a very effective way to find a match when we have a hair of unknown origin. The medulla as well is very unique between individuals. Some people have a continuous unbroken medulla, others might be interrupted or fragmented in a unique way. Some people have a medulla that takes up almost the entire hair shaft and some have no medulla at all. When having three or four hairs and trying to figure out who they come from, a medulla is a great way to identify it. Another thing that's unique with hair is it varies in its quality based on its location in the body. Forensic scientists actually distinguish human hairs into six different unique categories based on where they grow. There's head hair, eyebrows and eyelashes, beard and mustache, underarm, body hair, and pubic hair. Determining where in the body the hair you discovered a crime scene came from can be very insightful in what happened. Was there a skirmish involving someone's face where a beard hair could have came off? Was there some kind of sexual crime committed that could explain why there's a pubic hair? The age of a hair can also be determined based on where it is in its life cycle. The first stage of the hair life cycle is the antigen stage. In the antigen stage, that's from the beginning of a hair to about a thousand days. It makes up 80 to 90% of the hairs on someone's body. And at this stage, the follicle divides and the hair grows. After that 1000 days, a hair will enter the catagen phase. In the catagen phase, this is where only about 2% of the hairs in your body are, and this is when the follicle will actually recede from the hair and the hair will stop growing. The last stage in the hair life cycle is the telogen stage. In the telogen stage, this is well over a thousand days, about 10 to 18% of the hairs in your body. The follicles dormant and completely detached and this hair will likely fall out. So most often, if there's no kind of conflict at the crime scene, you're gonna find telogen stage hairs. But if there's something that could cause a hair to be pulled out, some kind of a skirmish, you might find an antigen stage. Again, knowing this life cycle, that's another way we can get insight into what may or may not happen at the scene. If a hair has been chemically treated, it can actually provide some unique insights into its history. If a hair is bleached, that bleach will cause the hair to have no pigment. It will bleach all the way through the cortex and the cuticle, indicating that the, and if you see something like this, now you know the suspect had their hair 
bleached. That could be very helpful in trying to identify them or figuring out where they've been. And if you were to dye your hair any color, that dye goes all the way through the hair, including the cuticle and the cortex. And that can quickly be identified under a microscope. Seeing that consistency of color is not natural in normally occurring hairs. And because hair grows on average at 1.3 centimeters per month, we can actually calculate when someone's hair was dyed should we find it. Here's how. When people get their hair dyed, the hair continues to grow, but the new portion that's growing hasn't been dyed. We refer to that as a hair root, and you can see this in this picture. So let's say you find a hair and someone's hair root is 2.5 centimeters long. When did that person dye their hair? Well, if I take the length of the root and divide it by the average growth rate, that will actually give me the rate, which is about 1.9 months or seven weeks. So something to keep in mind that all of you that think you're gonna dye your hair to try to get away and not get spotted. If investigators find those hairs, that's a quick way to determine when you dyed your hair and to look for products associated with however you dyed it. Hair is also dramatically different between the evolutionary ancestry of individuals. We all come from a long evolutionary history. Some of us are European descent, some are Asian, some are African, and countless other evolutionary and cultural backgrounds. Hair has evolved within these evolutionary groups. You can see here that European hair is generally straight or wavy. A people with Asian ancestry typically have straight hair and people from African ancestry can have kinked curly or coiled hair. This can help to further identify a suspect, but keep in mind, these are very general vague traits. They are not always conclusive and don't always pinpoint to the exact background of individuals. Every generation or ancestry changes. So even though these might generally be true a lot of the time, I wouldn't stake any weight in it they can vary dramatically between individuals. So what if you find a hair, you want to be able to determine if it's human or if it's another animal. For example, look at these two hairs here. One of these belongs to a human and one of these belongs to a pug. Could you figure out which is which? Well, human and animal hair actually have quite a few differences. They'll differ in their pattern of pigmentation, the size of their medulla, and the type of cuticle. Typically, animal hairs are denser, thicker, and have solid pigment masses, but it does come down to a species-by-species -species basis. The best way to determine quickly if a hair is human or animal is to calculate something called the medullary index. If you were to determine the ratio of the diameter of the medulla, that tube, to the diameter of the entire hair, it turns out that with cattle and with other animals, the medullary index is always 0.5 or greater. For humans, it generally is 0.33 or less. So again, do a quick medullary index, compare the diameter of the medulla to the diameter of the entire hair, 0.5 or greater, you have an animal, 0.33 or less, you're dealing with a human. For these two hairs, by the way, if you were curious, the hair on the left is human and the hair on the right is from a pug. Another way to compare human and animal hairs is to look at cuticles. The pattern of those scales is dramatically different. Imbricate, as you can see here on the left, with humans form a very stacked, smooth appearing cuticle. Whereas a coronal cuticle, like that of a mouse, looks kind of like an opening flower. And spinous cuticles from a cat, you can see the unique kind of reptilian scale-like pattern. This is just, again, another way to determine if you're working with a human and, or an animal and what kind of an animal. So now if you're called to the scene of a murder and the only thing you find is hair, could that be used to solve the case? Absolutely, in so, so many ways that we discuss in this video. I hope this was helpful in helping you in your future investigations that involve hair, and I'll see you next time.